We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else. Have yeah, to absolutely, because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, listeners and viewers, if you're actually out there watching. This is O'Reilly Radio 152, and uh, we're coming to you live from Saturday, April 29th, 2017, which is uh, unfortunately not in the future or in the past. It's in the present, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go O'Reilly. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I have my usual co-host, Fred Sims, my provocateur and traveling companion to ReasonCon. Just so, one co-host. Just one just co-host. Just one today. Okay. Well, you know, it's fine. It's fine. We we can get along with just one co-host. In fact, if if you weren't available to, I would still go on. The show must go on. But, you know, that's what I get also for um, ending up having to sleep through the normal Friday schedule. So this is an out-of-schedule uh, kind of thing, so I'm not surprised that no one's available to join us. So it's sad, but true. So, uh, we do make mistakes, so please, if you find any, go ahead and let us know. Send us a note at Podcast at gmail.com. That's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. Of course, we also have a voice line, which will also accept text messages at 470-222-O-R-L-Y. That's 6759. And also a big thank you to our Patreon supporters. We've got Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry and Daniel Duncan, who we got to meet at ReasonCon, which was fantastic. It was good to, to see him and give him a big old hug. And, um, well, uh, that leads us into our main, well, one of two main topics. So, ReasonCon. ReasonCon 3. I was at ReasonCon 2. That was two years ago. They skipped a year for the Reason Rally. They didn't want to... Um, have to share audience too much or give people too many things to do within a year so they have to spread their dollars around. Which makes sense because I think time-wise it was also right around the same time, wasn't it? Like mm -hmm. similar. So, I mean, it, it yeah. makes sense in that. You don't want to compete with something that is probably going to be slightly larger in uh, the ability to take over the uh, National Mall versus right. a swanky hotel in luxurious Hickory, North Carolina. <laughs> Luxurious. I don't know if those words on Hickory, North Carolina should necessarily go together. Until but, people see the size of that Hickory furniture store. Mm. That was an enormous complex, and we still don't know what, what they actually sell because we had to bug out. Uh, but I think next year, or actually, insider information, I'm not sure if it's been released yet, but I think it's been getting around. Um, ReasonCon 4, which I'm really hoping they drop the number. And just do reason con, and then maybe like the year number or something like that, because uh, I think that would be better for their banners and advertising. But you know, listen to me, Gene. That's that's what it's all about. Um, I think that we'll go up in twenty eighteen. No, twenty nineteen. Yeah, twenty nineteen. Two years. It'll be odd number of years now. Uh, so in twenty nineteen, we'll we'll go back, and I think we'll go up, and we'll actually spend an, another day up there, so that we can meet and greet people and actually maybe see the sights such as they might be and uh and extend the uh the vacation part of it a little bit because a lot of people did go up the day before because it's it's um on friday of the weekend there's a vip dinner and a little show and not that it was a little show seeing shelly siegel there was uh was fantastic she was um really rocked it out. It was good. Uh, they had good AV people there. It, it was a nice show overall. Uh, so Friday's that, and then Saturday is the full on convention starting at 9 a.m.? Yeah, the speaker started at 9 yeah. and basically went until we went to sleep. Like, not speakers, but yeah. all day events went until we went to sleep. Yeah, it was basically the podcaster throng at the end went until 1 a.m., or At until least. they yeah. removed us from the building. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I think I left about one a.m. somewhere in there because we had to drive back. So I had to 
had to cut it short a little bit. Uh, so a lot of folks arrive before Friday, you know, to get settled so they don't, so they can spend all of Friday, not just the 6 p.m. and on uh, with, uh, with everybody that they're, they've come to see. So I think another day would be help, helpful for that. Um, yeah, I mean, even if you just made the Thursday the travel day and you stay Thursday, you have that, like you said, the whole day Friday to see the people you want, you know, mm-hmm. maybe get lunch with any of the people you're interested in or just happen to bump into. Because that is, you know, if they do it at the same hotel, um, that area has plenty to do. Yeah. I mean, there was a ton of stuff immediately surrounding the hotel that you could spend that Friday. I mean, they had a, a fairly large size mall right down the road from it. You know, there are some things to check out, and it may be all Hickory has to offer, but, <laughs> but it was you all need right more than there. a day yeah. to, to check it out and see. And it was definitely all right there. So I'm just uh, pulling up the, the schedule because it's, it's been a few days and several drinks after that, so I'm trying to remember exactly how things went. So uh, we had, yeah, it, they, they brought the waterworks on really early. Yes, they did. Because uh, <laughs> they were talking about um, before Shelley came on, they gave some awards out. And yeah, they, they did the Team Tiny Dancer thing during the VIP, didn't they? Yeah, it was during the VIP dinner, and yeah. it was completely out of left field because that I mean there was no the the VIP dinner had no schedule really. It was yeah. there was a mention that they were going to be giving out a couple of awards, but they didn't say what they were or who they were for. So the only people that knew it was that they were about to punch you in the emotional <laughs> gut yeah. were the people that were throwing it, and those people still were crying. It so. was it was really super touching. Um, and I'll I'll talk about that sometime later when I'll actually have them on the show. Um, Jeremiah Bannister and Team Tiny Dancer. I'll I'll try to try to get them on the show because he's he's a really talented guy, and that was all about uh, his daughter. And man, I'm telling you, uh, if you go to ReasonCon, pro tip: bring tissues because. A lot of things there are going to be touching and emotional, and I guess it's kind of a humanity test. You know, if you don't cry at Reason Con a couple times, uh, then you may not be human. Uh, that just seems to be the way of it. So it's, it's really, really good. Um, well, that and you heartfelt. figure you, it's one of the few rare times during the year or two years that that community is getting together. Um, you know, so you take the chance to to either recollect or honor those things that occurred that yeah. would have meaning to that community. So, I mean, in a way, it makes sense, but at the same time, it was like, oh, uh, okay, I I didn't want to cry into my chicken. <laughs> it was I'm good chicken, good. though. <laughs> the VIP dinner, uh, the VIP package itself is really worth it. Uh, I still. Was that meatballs in the chicken? I, I'm i not even sure, but it was good. It was good. amazingly good, and yeah. I tried to explain it to Ren, and I'm convinced that it was chicken wrapped around a meatball and then sliced. <laughs> because I don't know what else that meat could have been, but it, it was, was another good. meat in the chicken, was and it, it was amazing. Was it another meat? I'm not even sure what it was. It yeah, was it was another, it was another really meat. Good. I know that much, because one of them, I think I had like three on my plate, and one of them I took the little section out. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a meatball, but I... Maybe it's like a sausage or something like that. Possibly. Yeah, that, that would be good. So um, what are we, what the hell are we talking about? I just realized that people that are listening to the show may have no idea what ReasonCon is all about. So from the website, ReasonNC.com, uh, the what, why ReasonCon. Uh, what is ReasonCon? ReasonCon is a weekend convention celebrating the educational secular community. We use these gatherings to support and educate humanists, atheists, agnostics, and free-thinking people and groups within North Carolina, and of course beyond, obviously. Uh, The goal of ReasonCon organizers is to bring awareness and unity to the secular community. Why is reason important? I think we can probably, on this podcast and our audience, I think we all kind of get that. But reason, or rationality, is traditionally about how people think properly. It tries to avoid bias and find truth where whether we like the truth or not. It avoids superstition, magical thinking, parochialism, faith, 
headheartedness and whim. Reason requires people to open uh, to be open to changing their mind. Reason also rejects the idea that authorities can or should tell us what the truth is. Instead, we should judge ideas ourselves and based on the content of the idea, not the person who said it. So, I think that's that's actually really well put. They did a great job just summing that up. And what about all this about podcasters? Uh, this is the skeptical free-thinking community. We find that internet content providers are usually the first place where people turn in which to validate concerns they are having about indoctrinated and logical contradictory beliefs. So, very often we hear p people say, blank podcast really helped me when I couldn't turn to anyone around me for support with, their, with the ideas I was having. Listening to an audio-only form of media can be very intimidating. Can be very intimate. I'm sorry, not intimidating. The opposite of that, <laughs> intimate and private. All you need is a pair of headphones, and no one in the world knows that you are listening to endless discussions of reason and/or hours of some funny shit that makes you laugh. Brought to you by people who think like you. Hopefully, think like you. I mean. Um, it, I don't see why you would be doing much in the way of listening if they didn't think somewhat like you. I mean, yeah. you could just be that one person who wants to, you know, naysay or argue with every person so you listen to the other side, which, you know, great. A lot of, lot of the shows too. want that and they want to have those discussions. Yep. So that's amazing too. But generally speaking, it's going to be a lot of people who think in the same way. And, you know, I think they, they pretty much sum that up well also in that, a lot of the time, you there are people that can't have those conversations or have no one to have those conversations with. Mm -hmm. So at the very least, they're getting as much of the argument as they can from people, you know, that they would be willing to have the conversation, that are having that conversation out loud for other people to hear, that feel the need to get their thoughts out on any number of topics, and you can listen in, it can help shape your views, it can take you to places maybe you didn't think, or it can give you some information where you're like, you know what, I need to check into that, and you know, the, the good thing about most of these shows and most of the people involved is they're also willing, much like the previous definition, to be reasonable, so if you come to them with information that would change their mind, not only are they going to say it, but you're probably going to hear it in the next episode. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. That's why we have an errata section yeah. in our show. Bring it to our attention. Correct our, correct our wrongness, because we would like to believe as many correct things and as few false things as possible. You know, hat tip to Matt Dillahoney for that one. Um, who actually was a speaker also at, at ReasonCon. Um, oh, it, they continue. Therefore, at ReasonCon... Each year, we celebrate the sacrifices that these particular content providers tirelessly put forth. We host a gathering to say thank you and offer an opportunity for these people who were touched and helped by having this medium in which to access can come out and meet their favorite podcasters and thank them in person. So, uh, Gene Elliott, who is the president of Reason NC Events Corporation, uh, says, as someone who definitely got comfort during the infancy of my transition from faith to skepticism from several podcasters myself, I am grateful for the effort they put forth to offer this perspective to the world. I will always be grateful. So it's funny that somebody that, that felt so grateful about that and still had that need to embrace the entire community would build an entire convention to bring everybody under the same roof to say thank you. And it's, it's, really, um, it's really touching, and Gene is an amazing person and uh, I, I, absolutely tireless yeah, in everything I think he was doing. His, um, his convention definition of what he was doing um, probably sums up his reasoning best of all, is that it's just an excuse to get all of his friends to come and visit him. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's that's all he's really looking to do is to get all of these people together and you know present them with amazing talks, with the uh, chance to mingle with a ton of different people, and you know generally just have a good time. Absolutely. So uh, Saturday we got to see Aaron Ra, who presented uh, a, a really great talk on 
oh, science and skepticism. And he's also running for uh, Texas State Senate. Or was it House Congress? Texas State Senate. Senate, because yep. he was going to be a senator, if at all possible. But, of course, that's a very... Uh, contentious red state kind of thing so i think very much in the in the vein of bernie he was kind of trying to drag them desperately over to the left as much as possible Um, or at least open their eyes to the fact that there are other people out there yeah that you know hey pay attention because we're here and as was a message throughout we vote and we're important you know Mm -hmm. we matter then we saw jim craig james dr james craig uh, he's a planetarium director, blogger, and science education advocate, and his, his talk was really outstanding. Uh, if you get to see any pictures about Raisin Khan, he's the guy with the red hat. Um, and he was just very intelligent. Everything that he was, he was saying was really spot on, I was think, um, yeah, I he, think I feel that I got the most out of his talk. Yeah, he had a lot of tips on how to engage people that don't necessarily think the same way that you do and you know how to engage them in a way that you're not going to drive them away with you coming at them and telling them no you're wrong yeah. you know rather than come at them in a combative way more conversation and people that you know listen to podcasts may hear this stuff you know all of the time um, you know with the socratic method of coming at people with questions and, mm-hmm. and that type of thing so in a way for some people it may be like you know beating beating the same drum over and over again but the what he was saying was really good and i i told you when we were there i felt like he was probably the best speaker which is crazy to think about when you consider the speakers i mean we've already talked mm-hmm. about aaron ra for for one and those people in the community know who aaron ra is if you aren't in the community or you don't know who aaron ra is yeah, i think he's definitely worth checking out i mean he's got uh, a show that he does um participate in called the raw man podcast and mm-hmm. you know he does some other things he's always at events he's always speaking he's got a book which you bought um, science educator yeah, yeah while we were there so i mean he's he's definitely out there he's a huge name in in the community and the movement um and for a guy that a lot of people i mean they made jokes that you know who's jim craig and you know yeah. there were people there i didn't know who jim craig was yeah. um and after his speech was done i was like wow that was really good and then after all the speeches were done, even though there were amazing talks, I'm like, yeah, Jim Craig, like that, that guy, it stuck out. And, you know, he yeah. had some visual aids and, you know, he was funny, but he was also direct and, and very informative. I, you know, it was that to me was one of the, the big, you know, bonuses of, of having been able to go was hearing that talk. Yeah, it was it was excellent. And now we have another voice to look to for real authentic teachings you know people that care and then as we get through um if you needed more reason to um seek out jim craig as we get through the other speakers there's a whole other Hmm. point in which he shined and it was just that was actually kind of amazing to me as well yeah totally so after jim it was callie wright of the gaytheist manifesto podcast um she's uh you know an atheist and lgbtq uh, activist and her talk basically the whole theme of this year's reason con was uh it really embracing and thanking science for everything and, and considering our current state of things important, yeah you know because uh well Aaron Ra went first because he had to go to the march for science in DC right so he had to he had to bug out right after his uh, his talk to to go uh, Callie's was, uh, was really good, really informative. Um, she presented some, some nuggets of, of science on, uh, transgender that I did not, I did not know. Of yeah, course, why would I? I? I'm a, I'm a cis, cis male. Yeah, I you didn't know, know so. that they had the science on that either. So, yeah. I mean, seeing, and again, visual aids and, and showing some of the things that she, um, had shown, one of which being brain scales uh brain scans um of a certain area of the brain Mm -hmm. for a cis male a cis female and a um trans uh transitioning male to female Mm -hmm. and the comparison yeah yeah, the comparison that was um the cis female and the trans woman being so close in 
you know, the scan that much more similar. Yeah, not identical, of course, no, no, but much, much more similar. But very similar, and yeah. similar enough that if you compared the trans woman scan to the cis male scan, they were clearly different. Yeah, you know, there was a clear difference there, and so I, you know not knowing that that science even existed, it's always good to see things like that, that if you ever happen to be in that conversation, you mm -hmm. can point back to and say, oh yeah, well, It's science. like, well, you know, there there is some scientific evidence that presents that someone that is born I, with male genitalia may have a female brain. That may actually be the case. There are parts of us that you cannot see that still make us what we are. And she went into the whole, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the, of the guy, but it was a twin study. And mm -hmm. during, during his circumcision, they botched it so badly that he lost his, he lost his unit. And the doctor was uh, trying very hard to figure out this whole nature versus nurture thing and thought that gender identity was purely a social construct. So he had encouraged the parents to go go along with a full sex change and to actually raise the the boy as a girl, and it essentially destroyed him. And he eventually, after I think he ended up being it was like six no thirteen when he was thirteen when the rest of it was supposed to to happen, um, he chose to back out. He didn't. He chose that no, this is not what I am, not what I want to be. And went on to have have a good life, mostly a good life. You know, married, had children, and adopted children because things did not go well because of um, some of the hormones and everything. And then he took his own life. So it's one of those one of those things that uh, gender identity is truly a part of who you are, and it's not a social concept entirely. So. Um, that guy's name, just so yeah. you know, that's David Reimer. David Reimer, um, yes. And yeah, basically, it was they he um, they were diagnosed with phimosis, which is um, a condition in which the foreskin won't contract over mm -hmm. the penis, and so they had to go in for circumcision to correct it. And it was his was botched, and. Yeah. Um, there was a um, psychologist named John Money, which basically convinced his family um, to use the twin boys um, as a... Uh, Control and experiment. Yeah, basically an experiment yeah. to determine um, how gender is in, in that construct. And yeah. um, it, it didn't work and obviously ended tragically um, yeah. at, in, you know, at the end of his... you know. Yeah, because that what would have been a tortured existence. It really obviously. messed it really messed him up. <laughs> so, so yeah, so take that uh, take that to the bank, if you will. And if you want to know more about uh, the the collision of being a secular person, an atheist, a non-believer, and also being a lesbian, bisexual, transgender somewhere on that spectrum, then you definitely should listen to the Gaytheist Manifesto. She does a fantastic job in everything that she's uh, she's doing. The the activism, she's really such a strong voice in the community that she needs to be listened to. And here's the thing, even if you don't think you need to know any more about that intersection, mm -hmm. but you just want to be a better ally. Right. You need to listen to that show. And um, uh, that was one thing I had caught up with her after the fact. And I let her know, um, you know, listening to her show shapes how I am. Because there are things I thought I was doing right. And listening to the show, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I could do it differently. Maybe I could right. do this better. Um, because you can't be an ally thinking you're doing everything right. You actually have to listen. Yeah. And and so even if you think you know everything you need to know about the intersection of LGBTQ rights and that community and the secular community, that's great. Mm -hmm. But listen, because I guarantee you, you can be a better ally, and she yeah. can help you get there. Now, that's not to say that she's going to have the, the silver bullet answer, because no. there is no silver bullet answer. If you have a room of like-minded people and get them get them talking about that same issue, each one of them will still have a subtly different 
take on whatever it is. So even though you're trying to be an ally as best you can, you know, everyone has to have a little bit of grace. They got to give a little bit. So when it comes to, say, knowing somebody's pronouns, like Ari Stillman, uh, knowing whether or not they are identifying as male, identifying as female, identifying as androgynous, neither. If you don't know, and you say something that is wrong, and they tell you, then you better, if you want to support that person and the entire community, you better adjust to what that person would like to be referred to as. Otherwise, you're not supporting them. You know, that's probably the, the simplest, quickest thing that you can ever do to piss somebody off, <laughs> is, is to ignore how they wish to be addressed. Especially once corrected. You know, right. Like and uh, try to always address them by the name that they wish to be presented as. Because if you dead name somebody, ooh, ooh, that's, that's bad. That's bad. The dead name being the name that they were before they transitioned or before they've taken on their new identity. Just don't do that. It's bad. It's not being a good ally. So, I was going somewhere with that, but it doesn't matter. So listen to the Gaytheist Manifesto. Uh, also, congratulations to her because she did one of the ballsiest things ever. And she, in front of a room of, uh, I don't know, 300 plus people, yeah. proposed <laughs> to her partner. And thankfully, Celeste said yes. So it was, um, that was really a tear-jerking moment as well. There's so many feels at this conference. Um, so that was that was a big deal, really big deal. And the way she did it was was really cool too. Mm -hmm. She asked everybody in the room that had a cell phone to yep. to you know hold their cell phone up and record the moment. And um, you know she basically went through her speech and went through the proposal and then went through like eight hours of hugging and a song from um, Shelley Siegel mm -hmm. and you know just a bunch of happiness and then asked everyone who took a video of it to send it to any of the legislators in North Carolina, um, yeah. you know, as proof of the amazing thing that just happened. Um, but also a nice little shove it in your face because here are two trans women getting engaged in the middle of their uh, yep. occasionally hate-filled state. And using the bathroom that identifies with them so we didn't get video of that though. no we didn't get that uh, no no that'd be inappropriate yeah just a bit. <laughs> that'd be inappropriate so then we had a had a lovely lunch and then um uh shannon the nebo finest of hickory north carolina chilies yes <laughs> it was it was okay <laughs> it really it was, okay. was it was okay yeah. it was, i mean that's sarcastic because it's a chilies but it, i mean it yeah. was a, it was a good lunch it was you know, again, everything is right there, so it was pretty much around the corner from the hotel. Yeah. Um, it, what felt like, uh, holy crap, we got to pick something. We're so far away. When we left, we went a uh, yeah, couple of blocks. Yeah, a couple blocks, and it's like, wow. Well, okay, this is back. food alley. Yeah. yeah, so there's plenty of stuff. So d don't worry about that. There's plenty plenty that you can do there. Um, so Shannon Nebo, the president of Be Secular and the treasurer of the Recovering from Religion Foundation and a, and a general secular blogger. Uh, she presented a, uh, it was secular parenting in addition to, um, to a few other things. It, she's getting used to talking, guys. She's getting used to it. It wasn't the best talk, but it was heartfelt, meaningful, and important. So the more people talk, the better they get. All you have to do is listen to the first few episodes of any of their podcasts that you listen to, and you'll realize that people do get better at things. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by everything that she's doing. She's a, she's a wonderful person and, uh, <laughs> and takes a really good ribbing. Yeah, she, she takes a joke like nobody else. She definitely <laughs> got the chance to talk, too, because that was mm -hmm. the, by that time, it was the third time we had gotten to hear her talk. Um, she gave a little presentation at the VIP dinner. Mm -hmm. Then she actually received an award and, and did a little, um, you know, just a quick talk after she got the award, um, also at the VIP dinner. So this yep. was the third time we had gotten to hear her. And I, you know, I, I will say when I, we went into it, it, you know, we, we both kind of agreed that it wasn't the strongest talk. But then it was one of those things where it's like, you know what, everything she's saying 
is something that should be said and mm -hmm. how is she ever going to get it out if she doesn't do, put the practice in yeah you know in the same it takes situation, a lot of courage a lot of courage if you put me in front of 300 people my talk is probably going to sound somewhat similar because i don't do this all the time right so you know it's a lot easier to sit here and have the conversation with you guys every week every two weeks than it is to all of a sudden 300 people are staring at me and just waiting for Lawrence Krauss at that point. Like, hey, we got a full right. belly. Where's where's the guy we came to see? And you're right. not him, you know, yep. that, that type of thing. So, Well, it wasn't Lawrence Krauss next. It was Matt Delhoney, right. uh, host of the AC Experience, a debater and founder of a really great resource, if you're not aware of it, Iron Chariots. Uh, it is basically a secular wiki and an answer to all the apologetics that, uh, that Christian theologians will put out there um iron chariots being the one thing that god could not fight against you know a, a little reference to uh to some biblical stuff in there um and his uh, his talk was was very good he talked uh, he's he's talked at length about how, everything that he's doing how he's doing it um there were some some fun questions from older folks in the in the gallery there which, which you were you were noting that you were really encouraged by the number of older people that were there at the conference yeah and a lot of it is because um the people that i'm more familiar with in the podcasting community the people that i knew that were going to be at reason Con besides us mm -hmm. um and and even us i you know i put us in the same age range you know we're yeah we're right there and same generation a, a lot of the people that I listen to are in that same age range, you know, it's, so when I look at it, I'm looking at people in my age range. Now, when I'm alone and I'm thinking of myself age wise, I'm already in the mentality, like I'm still like awkward teenage kid, you know, because I mentally, I like to hang out in that area because it's just more fun than to deal with all the seriousness of life. But when I actually think of it, you know, it's like, okay, well, these adults in this age group are the people that I'm seeing everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. when I think of like a Trevor Noah or, you know, the people that are representing, you know, like Samantha B, she's not that much further outside of the age range that I'm in right now. Right. You know, so when I'm looking at these people, that's the age group I'm seeing. And when I'm looking at the people so desperately trying to hang on and not change, it's the age group of maybe not my parents, but like the generation older. We're know. like pre midlife crisis age. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. We're getting close to the midlife crisis, but we're not there yet. So definitely the the uh, the person that we're, we're referring to. Um, I never did catch his name. I, I never did stop and, and talk to him. No, um, I only saw him when we were in. Yeah, in, he was. He was I only never there saw a him times. out and about. I only saw him in for the actual talks. Yeah, he was definitely there for that. Um, there were a lot of people that were there just to mingle. So there was like 420 people. That was the maximum capacity of the of the whole con. Some people at last minute couldn't make it, so some people you know picked up tickets, uh, will call kind of thing. Uh, but that was it's like 400 people were there. Not everybody was in the room at one time. Except for maybe a couple of the speakers, like maybe Matt and then Lawrence Krauss, who came on right after him. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Shannon's talk suffered in terms of uh, attendance, mainly because it was right at that lunchtime hour. Yeah, so we might have had a lot some of people were back there. Yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as like towards the end of her talk, and right before when Matt was going to speak, the room started filling. Yeah. And then, when towards the end of Matt's talk, into um, Dr. Lawrence Krauss talking. Uh, it was standing room. Like, there yeah. were people along the walls. Like, we no longer had chairs. If you weren't in there, you were going to be standing to listen to him speak. Yeah, it was, it was impressive. So, um, yeah, after Matt, it was Dr. Lawrence Krauss, theoretical physicist, uh, professor, and, and author. And he was, uh, um, real, um, we had talked about Arn Ross spoke early because he mm -hmm. had to go into the, the Science March in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, during his talk, Dr. Krauss uh, let us know that he had actually gone to the Science March in, in Charlotte, Charlotte yeah. um, before his speech. So it was kind of funny that, you know, our opener and our closer, basically, you know, they took time out of that day or scheduled around being able to be available at those science marches. So again, mm -hmm. that how important it is that two of the people we had and, you know, I'm sure more of them would have, right? You know, yeah. it's just we just happened to have two 
very prominent people that you know scheduled their their speeches around being able to also be available to those marches as well. And really, those those marches um, they were scheduled far after ReasonCon was. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> a whole convention takes a long lead time, so it's definitely not uh, not Gene's fault uh, that that there was a bit of overlap there. Well, no, because boy, a lot of people. A lot of people would have liked to go to those. And I thought it was really good, um, you know, in, in some of the things, because when the Science March for DC was announced um, and the dates had come out, a lot of people, you know, I saw some uh, in, through Facebook with, with some of the speakers, a lot of people having some misgivings about, oh, how are we going to juggle both? Or, you know, this is right. going on, what's going to happen? Um, and uh, Aaron Ross specifically was like, well, I'm going to make it work. I'm still honoring my commitment. I'm going to go and, and be at ReasonCon and meet the people and, and give my yeah. speech. But then I'm, I'm going to be taking off because I, I had specifically reached out and said, hey, are you still going to be there? And he let me know. He was like, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I'll give my speech. I'm leaving that day. I'm going to the march. So, you know, the, the fact that they were able to work around it, um, you know, because it, you know, one of those things where, like you said, it had been in works for so yeah. long. People knew about it for you know, as long as they had and the agreements made and, and that type of thing. So it was cool that it was able to, to work around um, the amount of people, like you said, that probably would have liked to have been yeah, I know, available I would have liked to go, both. but yeah, that's it, how the cookie crumbles. So obviously they weren't thinking about other things like that. They're just trying to get, get the exposure out there. And boy, there were a lot of people all around the world, well, at least all around the country, that were that were there that were marching on the local civic centers, whatever they happen to be, you know, whether they be in Charlotte, D- DC, all over the place. So there was a lot of marches, kind of like the women's march. So it's, um, it's an important thing. And we're, we're in that environment. We're in that political environment that we really need to, to push for things that are reason oriented, logic oriented, real live fact oriented, not alternate facts. Can't do that. That was definitely a theme. Yes. All, combating alternate facts and wrong ideas and things like that. Um, Dr. Krauss, uh, what, what did you think of, of his talk? Because sadly, at that point of the day, you know, it's four o'clock. That happens to be when my, when my inner spring starts to run out of juice. And that's when I hit the wall. And I kind of maybe dozed off halfway in the middle. Um, okay. No offense, Dr. Krauss. <laughs> I'd still like you on the podcast. <laughs> I have so many, like, I could have listened if you had wiped out everyone else. I could have listened to him just talk from nine o'clock until he would have had to have gotten the hell out in time for GAM. That for yeah. me, like, you, sorry, but you still got to go. <laughs> like, I appreciate you and your knowledge and you're ridiculously smart. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not even touching the surface of where your intelligence is like ridiculously smart is like me calling him dumb it doesn't it doesn't touch the level of intelligence <laughs> that that man has um and surprisingly human as i got to witness through the mingling he's um, he's he is human we'll just leave it at that we don't want um, to disparage anything yeah, he's, no, no, he's definitely surprisingly human i got definitely to see a human being. someone that you would look at and when he's talking to you you'd be like you are a goddamn robot because it's not possible <laughs> for a man to be that smart nope. and then see him in a human element interacting with other people. It, yeah. was, it was really cool. Um, but I, I, I like your take on that. Yes, yeah. that was really cool. Seeing him just be a human and also a really smart human exactly. being at the same time. Um, so. Be- really, because when you, whenever you see somebody like that, I mean, one, there's always going to be the intimidation factor of, yeah, I don't know why I'm saying words to you. For being I'm such never... a short person, he's really intimidating. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> impossible not to be. Yeah. Because what words am I going to say in a sentence that, when I say yeah. them to you, are not going to make you go, "I hope you burn in fire," <laughs> because you have just sapped IQ from me that I needed. To continue on oh. doing great things for this world that you can't even spell. <laughs> so, it, you know, like it was just yeah. one of those things that that's why, you know, for me, you know, I, I had commented, we had discussed it a couple of times, but just to see him being human mm-hmm. in that element and to see the things that, you know, as he interacted with other people, like that was another thing that I really took um, away from this. But yeah, I, I mean, I could have listened to him talk all day. Um, the stuff he was saying was melting my brain, but I was getting a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And I had 
so many questions afterwards. Is that, that was one of the things where he didn't have a lot of time just because of the way timing went. He right. had to go as well. Um, he had other other commitments. His flight was leaving. Um, and so yeah, was, he didn't stay for the podcaster thing. Unfortunately, no, not not at, at the end. But I mean, he yeah. he was there um, all throughout Friday after the VIP. He was mm-hmm. there um, for some of the morning. Um, on Saturday before he went to Charlotte. Right. Um, so, I mean, he was there. And, you know, obviously we're talking about seeing him interact with people. So he definitely was there to mingle. Um, and I'm sure had it not worked out the way it did, he probably would have been there. And yeah. in which case it would have been seeing him at a cash bar with a bunch of drunken fools trying to intelligently converse. Yeah. Um, Perhaps that is not where he wanted to be. Maybe maybe that was strategic on his but part. But again, when you're that smart, you plan three moves ahead exactly. chess wise. Like <laughs> he's 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 got the game finished, yeah. and we're like, oh, he had you know priorities. What? Later, there's a show coming on. Like, um, but yeah, I mean, I had so many questions, yeah. and I would have loved to um, ask him those questions just because. Help me understand better, you know what you're saying. Like, I was, I was happy that I did have a good takeaway. You know, I felt like I was taking in what he was saying, yeah. and it wasn't just uh, <laughs> what, you know, um, and, and everything he was saying. I mean, at one point he paused in his thing. He was like, "Oh, I'm not gonna, go, I'm not gonna explain that. It's not important." And the room was like, "No, no." It's like no, we want to hear that. Go back. We, we want to hear that. To wait, wait, what are you talking and about? They asked him to, yeah. you know, basically go back. So, and then watching him, you know, futz with the slides because he wasn't getting that. You know, it wasn't. Yeah. Commu- it wasn't cooperating with him. Um, it it I, would not be a convention with te- highly technical, intelligent people without technical difficulties. Right, technical difficulties. You have to have a few. So, and the projector was definitely where most of them happened. If, um, you know, if Jim Craig is my favorite speech, he narrowly beat out well the best thing about jim craig is that jim craig corrected him yes corrected lawrence krauss corrected you know right at the beginning during his talk and then (laughs) was told by dr krauss that he wasn't allowed to answer any more questions because he was answering them too quickly (laughs) you know he would basically no you're too smart you're too smart sir he would ask the question and and uh dr craig would answer it and then he'd be like, okay, I thought I got you on that one. And he'd go, yeah. so I mean, it was just like this this back and forth. It was great. With two <laughs> ultra-intelligent guys who, had you had the opportunity to sit and just listen to them. Both wearing lo- uh, large brim hats. Yeah. hats. So there's something about the big brim hat and being intelligent at this convention, say, protect apparently. your brain from UV rays. Yeah, I left mine up there. I should have brought it. Yeah, next yeah. time. <laughs> next like, time. You I... could just get in on that. Like, uh, yeah. Hey, look, guys, yeah, we've like, all got hats. No, I'm smart. I'm smart. I got the hat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just little things like that. So yeah, Dr. Krauss was uh, was amazing. I, I I was I was really <laughs> cognizant of the first part. The middle part kind of drifted me away, and then the last part, you know, I, I got it. It was and it I, was good. Honestly, um, you're not the only person I heard that had that yeah. kind of experience with it. Yeah. Um, and I got to imagine that I felt little, like in a college lecture. I yeah, really did. I, I felt like say, I was I in a college I lecture after lunch. A little bit difficult. Yep. You're after lunch. Your food is settled. You're just kind of in that yep. like time to relax mode. Yep. You got a guy up there who's speaking in like a nice, easy manner. He's yep. just kind of going over his stuff. You know, cracking some jokes here and there, but just giving you the information. And it's real easy to just kind of lose yourself. Yeah. In that, yeah. and you know, it's just one of those things. I'm gonna hide behind my circadian rhythm though because four o'clock is when i hit the wall all the time whenever i start to feel feel tired i look at my it's up four o'clock i can set up set set my watch by it really uh but fortunately really fortunately they did professional video recording of the whole thing yes so for 10 bucks guys go out to reasonnc.com and you can order a digital download of the whole speaker list the whole convention i mean the whole convention from the vip yep. all the way through the um live game cast which yep. basically ended the speakers you know portion yes. of the of the day yeah so for 10 bucks guys it's worth it you didn't have to go it's on sale right now for 10 it'll go up to 20 later that's what i hear so it's not like it's going to be a commodity that's then just going to go away they will have it available for download. But get it now, 10 bucks. It'll be available in about a month because, again, it's an awful lot of video. They're going to have to compile it. 
they're putting it together professionally. The the staff there that they had doing it was very good. They also, stuff that's going to be on that that we didn't catch. They did interview segments with each of the speakers beforehand in the lobby. Oh, really? So all of that oh, is so, okay, all yeah, so, all of that's going to be on there that we didn't catch. Okay, so basically the when we were there for the VIP dinner when right. I got that picture of Dr. Krauss sitting there, that's part of That's what that is. That's yeah. really cool. So all that's going to be on there. I already ordered it. So of course I'll talk about it once it's once I have it and have watched the whole thing again. Uh, which I will do <laughs> because it was really entertaining and I need to refresh my brain on all the things cuz man Resources. It and was they so you much, and, so much. Yeah. I mean, it, I I tried to live, you know, kind of tweet cast it a little bit, as much as as as, as I could. But no, my my brain, my tiny thimbleful brain runneth over with information. So I'll need to recap that as I go, and uh, I'm really glad that they did that. That's going to be amazing. So I'm I'm looking forward to that, especially because it's going to have. At the last bit, the God Awful Movies podcast team, uh, along with um, Thomas, Thomas Smith Smith, yeah. from... Everything. <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot. He's got Comedy Shoeshine, which is probably his least most uh, popular. Uh, then his um, with Andrew Torres, he's got... Opening Arguments. Opening Arguments, thank which you. Which would be his most popular, so you just... I don't know. Maybe. I think it, opening arguments is more popular than serious inquiries only right now. I don't know. I, I mean, it, I don't know. He he changed. He used to have a podcast, and he did over three hundred episodes called Atheistically Speaking. Yep. And then he shifted that because he started. He realized that he was not speaking just as an atheist. He was just speaking as a human being, looking at these events through a skeptical eye and wanting to have wanting to know more and diving in. So he he renamed it uh, just this year. Skeptical inquiries only. Serious. Serious inquiries only. See, if I went back through and actually edited this podcast as opposed to being live, I would, uh, I'd strike that and reverse it and remove that, that flub. But no, this is live. Yeah, the flaws are important. The flaws are important. The flaws are human. So, yes, I am human. And, of course, um, I'm, I'm going to maybe hide behind this drink, which was rum and gin. Yeah, all gin. And, and cherries. Lots of cherries. Okay. Um, so what did you think? You got to see God Awful Movies live. I have talked about um, the speakers, yeah. and I really enjoyed the speakers. Um, for me personally, I could have skipped every one of them. Um, <laughs> I've, I've mentioned God Awful Movies at least twice Probably more on yeah, our show it's, it's been often, as yeah. as a pick and or just bringing something up and, and discussing mm -hmm. it. Um, I when I started listening to podcasts, um, the first show I listened to was this one, and it was in preparation of. Hey, I think I might like to do that. You know, I I had met you um, not that far beforehand. Um, I was like, okay, well, let me listen to the show. I started listening to the show, and I was like. Wow, you know, I, everything that you guys were talking about, I had an opinion on. I was like, oh, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to to be part of these conversations. You know, we discussed that, and then you had told me about some other shows, and you had pointed them out. I think we had listened to a, um, you played for me a uh, one of No Illusions diatribes after yeah. the Paris attacks. Yeah. Um, and at that point, I still wasn't listening to anything else. But it was that introduction to things, and it just so happened that at this very same time, God Awful Movies was coming into being. Right. So I basically, I picked up listening to The Scathing Atheist, I picked up listening to Cognitive Dissonance, and through, it was actually Cognitive Dissonance, I was introduced to Eli Bosnick. Um, <laughs> I was working in yeah. maintenance at the job that I'm in now, listening to that show, and laughing so hard my sides hurt. Oh, wow. Um, you know, like that laugh that when you're done, you're like, oh, my God, if I laugh again, I'm going to die. Like something in here is going to break. Um, yeah. And I don't get that from a lot of comedians. I listen to so much comedy in my life mm -hmm. that you really have to hit at a specific thing. And, and Eli does that for me. The things he says, the ridiculous, sometimes crazy vulgar things he says hit 
at that perfect spot in my funny bone that I will just laugh until I cannot breathe anymore. And so when they had a movie review podcast talking about Christian movies and raking them over the coals, I was like, I'm in. So I've listened to this show from the beginning. I've listened every single week it comes out without mm -hmm. fail. That show drops on Tuesday mornings. I've got it listened to by Tuesday afternoon. It's done. It's in the bag. It, it's already listened to. Wow. Um, so for me, when they were like, God Awful Movies will be live at the, at ReasonCon, I was done. Like, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to be there <laughs> for that. I yep. want to see them do it. So it was at that point that I had a co-pilot on the way up. So much so that after... Uh, Dr. Cross got done speaking, and there was... Oh, this is a great story, guys. You need to listen to this. You really do. Okay. There was, um, what, like an hour and a half? Um, Dr. Krauss, and then there was dinner. Right. So... Okay, so I skipped dinner, and then the show was supposed to start... That's right, yeah, you skipped dinner. Yeah. I went, and I gassed up the car... Yeah. And and got like a rack of ribs or something. You went to uh, you Walmart know, and yeah, ate I was, ribs. I was silly. And then yeah. grabbed some food that I could have eaten once the show was done before the podcast was right. wrong. Um, and, and brought it back to the room. Yeah. And, you know, got some beverages as well. So dinner was scheduled, what, 5 to 7 or 5.30? It was 5.30 to 7 was dinner, yeah. 5.30 to 7. And then the show was scheduled to start at? Uh, 7. 7 p.m. Okay, so to 8.15. At yeah. 7. That talk yeah. ended... And the real quick decision was made because I had told Andy I would like to be as close to the front. For a lot of the the speakers, we were, you know, mid, mid yeah, mid, mid, mid of middle of the room. Yeah. You know, you could still see everything. It's not like it was a huge room or anything. Yeah. But middle of the room, uh, if you find some of my pictures on Facebook, you can see about the distance I was yeah. from most of the stuff. But I wanted to be as close to the front for um, the God Awful Movies live uh, broadcast as I could. Um, so after Dr. Krauss was done, we were kind of standing around trying to figure out what we were going to do, and I could see it looked like the uh, Puzzle in a Thunderstorm family, so basically Lucinda Lusions, Noah's wife, yeah. and uh, Anna Bosnick, Eli's wife, looked like they were claiming the front row. Yeah, Puzzle in a Thunderstorm LLC is the parent corporation of Scathing Atheist, the Skeptocrat and God Awful Movies and whatever else those trio do. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they were basically in setup mode. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that, you know, I pointed it out to you and I was like, okay, well, it looks like they're claiming that. So I'm not sure how this is going to work. But, you know, if we're back at a certain time and then the decision was made where it was just like, you know what, I'm going to stay here. And Andy was going to go do the things that he had mentioned earlier. Yeah. So I just walked up to the front row saw that they had indeed put down pieces of paper with names on the chairs and looked at the names. The very first chair, and the way the room was set up is you had um, a set of chairs that you know ran back from where there was a podium and a little stage, and then there was a little break for an aisle, and then another set of chairs over on the other side. So basically the one set of chairs that they marked off was, I mean, directly across from where the table was going to be set up that they had all the, you know, the speaker or the uh, mics and everything to sit down and do the show. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the pieces of paper and the very first one said Andrew. That would be Andrew Torres. Um, he is their attorney. Yes. Their <laughs> legal attorney. counsel for a puzzle and a thunderstorm. And for Thomas Smith stuff and mm -hmm. for uh, Marissa Alexa McCool, who, you know, we've had. And on the I show imagine before. probably for cognitive dissonance too. Uh, probably which would at be. This point, uh, Glory Hole Studios LLC. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's got to have something. I mean if if they're mm -hmm. you know doing the team up that they yeah. announced later, but I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, yeah. So Andrew was the first one, and then the second seat was um, Lucinda's seat, yeah. and Lucinda Lusions is tiny. She is a sprite. Yes, she, she is. is. She is a. Okay, if you look up petite in the dictionary. You will find a picture of Lucinda, and it'll be a measure taller than Lucinda. Yes. You know, <laughs> that's, is, that's where Lucinda is. I uh, am, she's just the perfect little person. I am really. six foot three and mm -hmm. a large individual. I'm 290 pounds at six foot three. Yeah. My wife is five foot three. She mm -hmm. would have felt tall next to Lucinda. 
It's just, you know, she's a tiny little thing. Yeah. Fiery, but tiny little thing. Yeah. So when I looked down and saw these names, I said, the seat behind this one will be the perfect seat for me to watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I proceeded to sit in that seat and hold my spot. Yes. This was, again, shortly after about 5.30. And as I'm sitting there, um, I'm just playing on my phone. I'm texting Ren, you know, kind of letting her know how the day is going, mm -hmm. letting her know, like, hey, I'm in the room with all, the, all these guys that I listen to all the time. I'm just kind of watching them set up. And then I notice that there is no one in this room that isn't a part of the show that's about to happen. Yeah, they, they had signs posted that, yeah. you know, stay out, basically. <laughs> they, were, they were putting the signs on as I was yeah. noticing that there was no one else in this room that wasn't a part of the show. And so <laughs> while I'm sitting there and I'm texting, the realization starts to hit me that, oh, maybe I'm not supposed to still be in here. Like, maybe I should go. But they're all too nice to actually say, hey, could you get the hell out? So I could. They really are nice people. Like, they really the, are. The conversation might have been had at a level to be like, maybe if he hears us, he'll realize what's going on and just kind of go on his own. Because again, the community, you know, dynamic is yeah. you should be smart enough to pick up on these things. True. I am smart enough to pick up on these things, but the battle was still there <laughs> where I was like, do I want to be the dick who just sits here and is like, no, I'm, no here. I'm here. I'm You're here. gonna have to deal with me being in the room. I'm now a part of this. Like, I just sign me up. Where do I got to sign for the LLC? Because I am now. I live here now. This is what happens. Or show me the NDA. I'll sign yeah, it. Or do I want to put down my reason con badge? You know the, that we had. Mm -hmm. Mark the seats as mine and slink out so that I'm not that dick. That's like I don't care. Just do your thing. You know, so I made the choice to mark the seats and I stepped out and um, I was just kind of hanging out with the group, you know, that was outside. And sure enough, they, they had on the thing, not yet, you know, please don't come in. And it was like, oh, well, they didn't kick me out, but I think it was a definite like implied maybe yeah. please just give us this little bit to get everything set up. And yeah. um, then, you know, once the show opened, I went in, you know, nobody had messed with the badge. Again, part of the group, it's not like, the people we were there with were yeah. going to be a bunch of jerks. So um, we got to sit essentially second row back from the show happening yeah. live. Um, I sat behind Andrew Torres. Um, so some of the pictures that I that I posted, uh, I actually tagged his head, um, which he, he replied to. So, you know, it's <clears> – <throat> the thing about podcasters is that this community is – it's not like regular media, folks. It's everyone in it is really accessible. Like anybody that's listening to this right now can send me a message on Facebook, can tweet me, can email me, and I will reply probably within 30 minutes or less, and I will have a conversation with you. This is an open invite to talk to us all the time. You know, it's fine. We we aren't doing this for fame and fortune. We're doing it to express our opinions and to to talk to a very specific audience. And I mean, you it's know. it's such an open invite. That yeah. It was short notice, but before we started tonight, mm -hmm. I had shared out on Facebook, you know, basically, hey, you know, we're doing the show. If you want to crash it, come on in. You know, I knew it yep. was only going to be um, me and you, so I put it out there. Now, it's, it's you know, last-minute notice, so a yeah. lot of people aren't going to be able to take advantage, but it was still out there. You know, it, it, right. had anyone responded, it would have been like, okay, we're going to set up the Skype call. Come and join us. We see if we can make it work, um, you know, just to sit and have conversations. Um, my hope was that maybe someone else that had gone to ReasonCon might have seen it and been able to jump on. Yeah. But it, it was so short. You know, I did see a couple of at least likes, like Gene. He liked it, but he was at a concert right now, so right. He, he can't join. Um, you know, and it's just one of those things where you know the accessibility of everyone there um, makes it real easy. Because I'm like myself specifically, I'm I'm not good in large groups of strangers. I just yeah that that leads me, um, you know, beyond the beyond the the god awful movies, which right. was amazing. By the way, yeah, I didn't even get into that. I mean, the story of, of it's basically stealing phenomenal. our phenomenal, yeah, was a story f just for us, yeah. But the show itself was re 
ridiculously good. It is probably one of God, my favorite hilarious. live things that I've seen, and I've seen a ton of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, but it it was just funny to see them all interact. It was funny to see kind of how they work it because as you're watching it, you know that's how they do it. Yeah. You know when they're recording what you listen to, all you know for me one take every y'all week, one take. Yeah, you know there was no these are pros. They did it. It was essentially live. You know, they mm-hmm. recorded it, but it was essentially live. If what you listen to, if you go and find the one from ReasonCon and listen to it, yeah. what you are hearing is what we heard. Now, the interstitials are a little different because they actually record those for people listening right. to the podcast. And there was a little bit after they were done with the show that we got that, that you wouldn't get by listening to the podcast. Probably. But everything yeah. else is exactly what they did while they were sitting yeah. up there. You can listen to us. We are part of the live audience. We are cheering. We are making silly things. You are the wiggle fingers? I, yeah. The wiggly I'm, thumbs? I am those wiggly thumbs. Those are some yeah. wiggly thumbs, sir. Those so. are some wiggly thumbs. That is Fred Sims. Uh, so now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Uh, but really, <clears throat> after all this, and th- this is where I get to muse on the whole conference as a whole, and podcasting in general. These people that are behind the microphones, which would include me, it would include Fred, it would include Eli Bosnick, it would include No Illusions and Heath and everybody else, you know, Thomas and Andrew, maybe not Andrew, but these people are introverts Let me just say that again. These are introverted people. They have a very special psychology that presents in in the way that they don't want to necessarily be the center of attention, but they also have words that they have to say. So when you're listening to the podcast, know that these people are really actively going outside of their comfort zone in many ways to present themselves, to present their opinions, their thoughts, their, their soul, in some cases, to the audience, to a bunch of people that they've never met, have no idea about, and they're just putting it out there. Some of them really have a huge reach, and they're, they are impressed (laughs) just putting it mildly they're very impressed that there are people out there that would listen to them they don't think the highest of themselves you may get the impression that they have this huge attitude like eli bosnick for instance eli is an amazingly sensitive person and every picture that you see of him is some goofy trope it's some goofy goofy thing And he does that on purpose, because if he makes it that way, then no one else can make him that way. It is an intentional thing where he is then controlling his situation. It's funny. It's funny that all these people that we listen to, because I listen to a lot of podcasts, I know Fred does too, and I know that if you're listening to this, you're already listening to a podcast which puts you into a percentage of people, about a quarter of the U.S. right now is interested in podcasts, by the way, which is a big market. So, listening to these people is a personal thing. We don't on this side of the microphone, we don't necessarily know that. You know, we put it out there, and we don't expect anyone to listen. We don't expect anyone to comment. We don't expect to be heard. We're putting it out there into the ether and hoping that somebody thinks something. But we're doing it mostly for ourselves, really. These are things like with O'Reilly Radio. I am doing this because I have to. I have to think about these things. I have to be involved. I have to look at the world, and I have to dissect it for myself, if for no other reason than to be informed. I figure I'll bring everybody else along the way. Why not? Because it's edutainment. You know, I'm going to go through, and I have to laugh at these things, because otherwise I will cry. 
because the world is a stupid, silly place, and we just have to do that. So I figure if I'm going to laugh, I'll make some other people laugh too. And going through and meeting all these other people that I listen to, um, I've got a lot of people that are now on a list that are going to join us at some point because uh, the podcast has been going on for quite some time now. We're in episode 152. So we've got some staying power. We're sticking around. We're not a flash in the pan. There are other people that still have, still are finding their voice. Some people that have switched gears and are trying to figure it out. Of course, we've changed gears many times too, but that's just part of the evolvement, evolving process that is, uh, is radio and podcasting. It's normal. So we're going to have other people come on. We're going to have new guests. And all of these people are other podcasters, and they are people that are similar. They're just like you. All of us out here are just human beings trying to make sense of it all. Some of us have managed to put together enough equipment to actually talk to you. This is a very democratizing process. Anybody can do this. And if you're listening, then I thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I want you to talk to me. And that's the other thing about this. All of these people, all the people in the podcaster throng, all the other podcasters that were there, even Lawrence Krauss, wants you to talk to them. Because it's a human connection. It's a human interaction. They don't exist in a vacuum. And um, Ari Stillman, who is a co-host of the Gatheist Manifesto, along with Callie Wright, uh, they were there because their pronouns are they, their, you know, etc. Uh, they were there doing their thing. And if you listen to Ari, they say that they're in counseling, they go to a therapist, and they want to understand themselves and they want to get better. There's a lot of things that are wrong. And after ReasonCon, Ari posted to, to, her, to their blog on Patheos. See, I almost screwed it up. I'm very sorry. Very close. I almost did it. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, they posted to their, their blog on Patheos and it was a big, huge thank you to the people at ReasonCon for expressing to them how much it meant. It was huge. It was huge. I, I tear up even thinking about it. And I went up to them and I said that their words are important and I, th I thank them for everything that they said and being out there. And there were several people that did it to me too. Several people came up to me and, and were were thanking me for uh, for all the things that I did. And it's I, I... Again, I'm taken off guard. Because I think very little of what I'm doing. They all think very little of what they're doing, too. They don't expect to be the center of attention. This is a very intimate thing. When people, when fans, listeners, come up and say anything at all, it matters. So the whole podcaster throng thing is an enormous deal. It's huge. Because it lets people know that they're listening. That their voices are not going into the ether and falling on deaf ears. That some of those demographics of, you know, hearing, seeing who's listening and, and what country and things like that, it's like, oh, wow, there's, there's somebody that actually tuned in or whatever over in another country or in that state or whatever. That's nice. But then to actually get feedback, it builds the community. And it is a big, big deal. So... I just found, uh, found it very interesting that all the people that you're listening to are pretty much introverts, in a way. Mm -hmm. And this is private enough 
that they can put themselves out there. They can talk into a microphone that's just in front of them. They can speak into a webcam if, if that's the blogger kind of thing they're doing. And they can present their ideas and just put them out there and see what happens. And to actually get feedback, that's where the community starts. So be interactive. Contact these people. They're listening. It's not like trying to talk to Tom Cruise or anything like that. These are real people. No, and I, I promise you yeah. they will remember who you are. And I can yep. promise you that because, you know, when, when Andy says he doesn't think a lot of what he does, um, you know, he just does it because he has to. Um, take what he feels about what he does and then what I feel about what I do for the show is levels under that. You know, I, I do the show because I think it's fun. I enjoy having the conversations with everybody that, you know, we're able to, to have on, you know, whether it's me and you or it's our full panel with, you know, David and Steven and Amber and, um, Dan and, you know, like all these voices that you get to hear, um, you know, I love that, and and I do, or at least I try to do a lot of stuff behind the scenes to get other people to to get recognition, to get people to pay attention to what we're doing. Because while we're not in this for fame or fortune, I mean, the goal is still to have people listen, to interact, to to have those you know meaningful conversations. So you know, I want to be able to do that, um, and so part of that is making myself available of the community so you know you find these people that you listen to and um or that listen to you and you befriend them on facebook or whatever your social medias are so i have you know i have people on my facebook that i'm friends with that i've never met never really talked to but you know something in what we're doing or the way i interacted on social media had them reach out to me you know, so, okay, I'll accept it, you know, because that's another person I can share everything that I share when I'm trying to do, you know, the, the bit of promotion I'm able to do for the show. Mm-hmm. But being that little part of these communities, you know, um, when I go to, you know, the, the mingle after the, the VIP dinner and I go up to after debating with myself for 15 minutes yeah. for the first time to go up to, to Eli Bosnick, who obviously I've talked about. You know, I, I have a, um, what I feel, you know, I have this connection to him that he doesn't even really know. You know, right. the connection is one way, like you said, the personal thing, um, the, you know, the, the man crush on Eli Bosnick. So I have to talk <laughs> myself into going up and talking to him. And when I walk up and introduce myself without looking at my badge, which would have been the dead giveaway, you know, <laughs> without looking down and yeah. he's looking at me in the eye and I'm like, hey, you know, um, uh, you know, love your work. And, you know, like my name's Fred. And he's like, yeah, Fred from O'Reilly, right? You know, Again, just the the interactions we've had. I've talked to him a couple times trying to get him on the show. We've mm-hmm. had conversations via his, you know, posts on Facebook, you know, short, you know, kind of thing. Um, when I read, because um, we had both contributed to Marissa McCool's first book. Um, well, not first book, but the most recent book yep. that she had written. Um, after I read what he had wrote in the book, I reached out to him and told him, you know, I, I really appreciated you know, what he had to say and reading it. And it kind of helped me with a, a similar situation that I was dealing with. Um, and we, we talked briefly there, but to have this person that again, you may not mean to, but you kind of put up on a pedestal a little bit because you're a fan, you know, you're, you're right. looking at them from, from fandom. You think um, they're more important just automatically than, right. than you are. And, you know, for that to be his response, you know, again, I'm immediately texting Ren and being like, this is what he said when I was talking to him. You know, that that little bit of interaction is like, holy shit, like, he actually remembers who I am. And that's kind of what Andy was saying, is like, you think so little of what you're doing, yeah. that why would I rate to this person? Why would they know who I am? Yeah. And the same thing with, with Callie Wright, um, who my interactions have been even less with. Um, I do occasionally get into conversations on her Facebook posts, depending on what they are. Um, you know, we've 
very little interaction, but I, I did, you know, there was some tagging of the pictures that I was taking because um, I, I took about 100 pictures while we were there documenting the whole thing. It's available for anybody to find. It's in its own little album. You can find it, you know, ReasonCon 3 um, on my Facebook. It's open to the public. Did you share out to the ReasonCon? There was like a whole... Uh, photo thing that ReasonCon 3 was actually doing, too. Um, I'm not sure. I need I'd to have share to, out to there, yeah, too. Yeah, I may have to go back out and look. Yeah. I tagged basically all of my friends that were also at ReasonCon, mm -hmm. um, got tagged in the thing. So my And, and a lot of them, like um, Anna Bosnick liked the album, Lucinda Illusions liked the album. So a lot of people, you know, have seen it. It's gotten yeah. some, you know, some spread, which, you know, that was the whole, the whole point of me doing right. that, you know. And I took pictures from literally the drive up all the <laughs> yeah, way to the drive back so um you know there, there's stuff in there but when i went up and talked to callie and you know i i didn't introduce myself at first i congratulated her on her engagement and then i i told her what i said about really appreciating how she's helped to guide me as an ally and she was you know she, her response was i you know i'm really glad that you came up and talked to me what's your name and i said oh my name is fred and she was like oh fred sims from facebook and i was you know again it's that that interaction where mm -hmm. you know you you don't think of that in that way yeah. it's again this is somebody with a, a larger voice than what we have here um and when you have that interaction it's like oh i i wasn't expecting that at all so I promise you, if you engage with all, any of these people, um, especially us, yep. please engage with us. Um, but if you engage with any of these people, they will remember you. You know, it is meaningful to them enough that they're going to, they may not even immediately respond when you're trying to engage. Right. But when you get the chance later, something is going to be like, hey. Yeah, it'll all click through. The yeah. human brain's amazing that way. And so, you know, that, that type of thing... Um, you know, for me, I wouldn't even say that part was, you know, like the super fun part. It was just that was very cool to experience. You yeah. know, these people that I look to as form of celebrity, that it would be like other people going out and seeing Tom Cruise and them being like, hey, Stephanie, what's up? You know, like yeah. it's that same type of thing. These are the celebrities in my world. Like I would much rather meet and hang out with some of these people, most of these people, than, you know, pick a movie, name the celebrities. Yeah. I'd rather hang out with these people because they're, this is, they're more this is our tribe. in my life. Yeah. <laughs> this is our tribe. This is where we are. It's a... Uh, it's just one of those remarkable things, and it it makes me want to keep doing it. You know, if anything, it reinforces that there are people that listen. We are making an ever so subtle difference. It may be a, a Sisyphean task to keep pushing the the boulder of skepticism and rationality up the hill of doubt, but it's something that we have to keep doing. And these little things are very encouraging. So uh, expect more O'Reilly Radio in your future. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. That's for sure. Uh, you know, 152 and going strong. So we will keep doing it. Um, the after party was definitely uh, definitely amazing. And I, I don't really know uh, where else to go with this other than I, I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, a little... A little sad that the next one's going to be two years away, but definitely right. gives time to like make sure you know everything is is uh, affordable and you know yeah. you can save you pay up off the credit card from this one. And, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know make sure that you can still because yeah. again, if you're going to go, go with the VIP route yeah. because you know like the the normal day that's all well and good, but the the ability to kind of have the night before with all these people and enjoy a dinner and. Um, you know, the stuff they're going to do for you at the VIP, um, you know, set up and, you know, with the, the early speakers and, the, you know, the awards and the things that they're going to present to you. Um, and, and they really, you know, they, they, it was really solid treatment for those people that, you know, put that little bit of extra in and, and were there early and, um, you know, were willing to, to give their time and, and that little bit of extra to be there with them. So... Um, definitely go VIP because it'll be well worth it to you, you know, even just for that little bit more interaction um, that, you know, everyone else may not get. 
It's good stuff. Really good stuff. Um, in wrapping up this section of the show, because we'll we'll go on to um, to the Trump things in in the B side. But uh, one other thing that we did was we listened to a couple of audiobooks on the way because it's a long trip. It was it was eight hours, easily one way mm-hmm. for us. You know, six hundred miles. Um, so I I inflicted a couple uh, a couple audiobooks on Fred, uh, which is the first time you've ever listened to audiobooks. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I prefer like actual books in hand. Um, I would rather, and again that goes to the the in a way the um introverted part of me i guess like for me the preference is kind of lose myself in a book sit off by myself read the book and it's always been i can immerse myself in the world and kind of you know envision everything better that way and Mm -hmm. i know listening to some of the longer podcasts i've listened to how sometimes i can you know kind of like how it was for you during um Dr. Krause's speech, yeah. where sometimes you know it may just be that time of the day or whatever, you kind of lose yourself in the talking, and then maybe yeah. you don't pick up some of what was said. And you know, I've stayed away from audiobooks for that reason because I didn't want to go into reading or, or listening to this book and then miss half of it because it's not catching my interest the right way or I'm not able to immerse myself the way I want to. So you know, those were the first ones that I had ever really listened to. Um, well, all, I've, so. I've, uh, I find that uh, listening to audiobooks is sometimes like listening to a song. So you'll want to listen to that song again. Right. So it, it's not necessarily bad uh, to go through and, and re-listen because even when you're just reading, sometimes your brain can play those tricks on you where you're still you're reading the words, but they're not doing anything for right. you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you can, you can fall into that doldrum the same way. So sometimes rereading is also the same Which same I usually way. end up doing. I mean, I have some yeah. very well-loved copies of books. Yeah, exactly. So it's the same thing with audiobooks. We listened to The Dispatcher. So these would kind of be our picks for this episode. We listened to The Dispatcher, which was a short novella, uh, kind of like a two-hour audiobook. Uh, by John Scalzi, and that was uh, definitely, th- this was my second read-through, um, listen-through, or enjoyment-through, depending on however you like to like to call it. I call it enjoyment, typically. I've enjoyed this audiobook, or enjoyed the book. Um, and it was, it's such a compelling and weird environment to be in, because it's, it's the same reality that we inhabit. Mm-hmm. With one major difference. Yeah, I mean... And then the consequences of that difference. There's not even, like, technological advancements. Nope, really. it's, it's all it's the same. It's exactly the same as yeah. what we have right now. Which makes it really easy to adapt your brain to. It's like, oh, but then, oh, mm-hmm. and then that, oh. So, um, the dispatcher is, not to give any spoilers away, really, is about... Really, it's kind of like a film noir kind of thing. It's a dark um, um, beat cop kind of thing. Private Eye. Where the private eye in question is a dispatcher. Not really a a private investigator at all. But what dispatchers do is they purposely kill people. But the, the thing about this universe is that when someone is killed, when someone is murdered, they poof, they go away. Their body, their physical body evaporates, goes away, and they reemerge wherever they essentially slept before, like in their bedroom, in their home, without any damage and alive. And that's about all I can say about the book because the rest is twisty and it's interesting. It's really an interesting take. I mean, it's only it's only 2 more, hours. Yeah, it provides a lot more information about the dispatches. Yeah. And um that is super important that that whole dispatch um as like I'm dispatching you because when Andy was like, "Oh, it's called the dispatcher." My former um LEO brain was like just a, a dispatcher like you know like <laughs> that was what i was thinking yeah. and then as as i'm 
listening to the story and it's unfolding, I'm like, oh yeah, not a dispatcher. Like, you no. know, like, because the opening scene is sending them off. <laughs> yeah, the opening scene is in a, a, a hospital surgery, you know, like yeah. an OR. And I'm like, what, what the fuck? fuck does this have to do with yep. a dispatcher like i don't understand things didn't and, go well with the with the open heart surgery and it very quickly yep. reveals to you that yeah i didn't mean dispatcher like i'm working the phone lines yeah that, that kind of dispatcher so mm-hmm. it completely i was thinking something totally different when we started that, that yeah. book and actually it is um the first thing i've ever read or listened to by scalzi as well so it was. It added an, yeah. an author to my list of like, hey, I need to check these things out. Yeah, his his old man's old man's war series is filled with humor and interesting uh, aspects of of humanity and and uh, and science fiction. Um, it's it's just he's a really great author in the way he writes his characters. They're it's it's humorous. But again, I mean this. Uh, this was a novella, mm-hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll say that for me specifically, like when I'm reading, um, one of my favorite authors is Stephen King. Yeah. Um, he he fits that bill. I've been reading him since I was a teenager. Um, but my favorite pieces of work by Stephen King are his collections, Nightmares mm-hmm. and Dreamscapes. You know those things like that, where it's the short stories yeah. packed into. I love them. So this is. Again, fits right into the things that I I adore because this would fit into if you told me that he had a anthology of short works and this was just a, a two hundred pager or whatever however many pager yeah. in there because like the mist from Stephen King it's a huge section of one of his anthologies you know and it would just be like okay well this one's longer than normal he's gonna make it up with like a two pager later um, <laughs> yeah it would fit exactly into that so in reading this and the the conversations we had during listening and then after um just because when you listen to this you're going to want to talk to somebody that's listened to it. like yeah. if you haven't ever read it or listened to it share it with someone else at the same time or mm-hmm. immediately after because you're going to have so many things just to to ponder on that you know like it it you could take almost any aspect of the book and be like well that could be a whole other book just explaining yeah. what that is or how that works or where that's going to go um so it's just like when i hear you know or this short little novella i'm like okay well this was amazing what are his long form books like what are his actual novels like so it that that's the type of thing that will immediately draw me into wanting to read an author more is if you have good short work or good short stories or little novellas like that i'm i'm pretty much sold because even it, you know, I can always go back and find more stuff that I can enjoy quickly in right. that form. And it was read by Zachary Quinto too, so it uh, it gave us an interesting, um, a really professional narration. Yeah, and he did of the really book. good. He did, with he the did a great job. He, yeah, yeah, it was it was super cool, especially because it's a voice you recognize for a mm-hmm. lot of it. Um, so it's like, oh, cool, Spock's reading me this book. This is really nice. You know, yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, because for those that don't recognize the name, he's he's the new Spock in the in the new versions of uh, of the Star Trek trilogy. Uh, trilogy. What am I saying? That no, no, the Star Trek series. Um, I'm thinking about books. So yeah. I'm automatically thinking it's like, oh, okay, that's a series now. Anyway, well, I mean that, and yeah. there's three of them right now. So, well, maybe I'm right then. Okay, there we go. Well, like currently, there are three. <laughs> So currently it would be the new trilogy, but yeah. I imagine that a lot more are coming. I'll leave a link for it in the show notes. Uh, we also listened to Good Omens uh, by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. Uh, and it was, uh, it's very British. Yes. <laughs> it's very British. I'll leave that for you. Uh, but again, it's um, uh, in the whole reason con kind of aspect with, you know, very secular and thinking about things that are not necessarily religiously oriented. Uh, I think it kind of fit pretty well with that whole, um, um, genre, I guess. And it was, it was a good book. Strangely, I don't have as much to say about it as the shorter book. And that's the funny thing. Usually as, as an avid book reader or book listener, and somebody that's on the road for, I kid you not, I'm on the road for at least five hours every day, Monday through Friday. So I can go through some books 
real quick. <laughs> so I like long form because, again, I'm buying books through Audible. I want to get some bang for my buck, okay? The Dispatcher being only two hours, I would not normally recommend a first book in Audible to be two hours. I wouldn't recommend it usually because you're not getting as much as you would from, say, a Peter F. Hamilton book, which is 36 hours. You know, you're obviously not getting as much there. But the story and the narration, all of it, it's worth it. It is one of those, it's a seed that it, it'll grab you, it'll bring you in and say, I want more of this kind of thing. So I definitely recommend The Dispatcher. Uh, Neil Gaiman's Good Omens, uh, Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman, Good Omens. It was great. It really was. If you like the, the Wheel of Time series, if you like anything by Neil Gaiman, if you like anything by Terry Pratchett, it's the same kind of humor. Uh, it's, it's great. It's really one of... It's a fun book. Yeah. Um, the, we listened to the unabridged one, so we got all of it. Uh, perhaps the abridged one, if it's available to you, um, might appeal more to you because it would get rid of some of the, the fluff. But really, we get a... We get a really good view of the Antichrist, and the Antichrist isn't a bad guy. No. Yeah. He gets and a little yeah. confused for you know a brief second, but yeah. you know that quickly writes the ship and you know goes about his business. I, and I think yeah. um, you know what you're saying with uh, you, you don't have as much to say about the the much longer book um, as you do because I mean it. What it the Dispatcher was only two hours, so I yeah. mean we were. Just outside, or no, it, it got us through Georgia, because we, we picked it up yeah. a little bit past our drive, so... You Two know, hours and 19 minutes, yeah, for those Yeah, it got us through curious. Georgia, because I remember being close to the end, and all of a sudden we were in North Carolina, I was like, oh, holy crap, and you know, we were like, oh, well, we listened to an entire book through Georgia, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it... Uh, it's still lengthy, you know. It's two hours. You're sitting down and, and listening to a feature film, essentially. Yeah, but, yeah, um, that's basically it. Yeah, but Good Omens basically was the rest of that trip, and then a large portion of the trip home yeah. as well. Um, so you know there was some definite listening, but in the long form version, you can go into things a little bit more than you can in novella, obviously. So there wasn't. I mean, there were questions. We still stopped and discussed a couple of things, mm -hmm. and there were definitely a lot of quips that required like some acknowledgement, but there wasn't as much to dive into question-wise in terms of, well, how is this going to work? Because if you just listened, they'll tell you how it's going to work. You know, they, they, it really went through and explained a lot of um, what was going on within the book itself. But I, I really enjoyed both, um, and I thought it was really funny that... Um, you had suggested good omens to me a couple of days before we left, and I was yep. like, "Sure, I'm I'm all for that." You know, let's let's listen to that because um, I, after you suggested it, I had never heard of it, so I looked it up, um, read the synopsis, and I was like, "Oh, this sounds great. This sounds you know like it'll be a really good read." Um, and then some people that I know on Facebook had also posted that they had a copy of it, and I was like, "Oh, holy crap! You know, small world. I just found out about this book. Really? Yeah, I'll be listening to it." Um, but yeah, definitely uh, funny, entertaining, um, really cool characters. Um, some of them more rich than others. Some of them, you know, they they get what they need in order to survive as a character. Yeah. Um, but yeah, listen to it, read it, go and find it somewhere, buy it. It's it was definitely uh, entertaining. I had, my personal pick between the two is the Dispatcher, just because. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you have to listen, and I, I'm sure you'll have the same thought, but, you know, the, the Dispatcher, to me, was better in the end, but they were both really good books. Yeah, I mean, it, it, for only being two hours, it was really concise. It got, it got the job done yeah. in a really quick fashion. Good Omens was 12 hours and 32 minutes in total. Um, apparently, in Kindle version, it's like 432 pages or something like that. So uh, the nice thing about, you know, I'm not giving an, aud an audible ad, but right. this is ending up being an audible ad, so they're getting it for free because I'm just a fan. Um, so it's 12 hours and 32 minutes on audible. It's also like 432 pages in Kindle. It is um, 
whisper sync ready so that you can actually switch between the Kindle version and the audio version if you're the kind of person that, you know, I've got a commute where I can't necessarily read, but I also like to read like you do, Mm -hmm. you know, then you could have both. You could have both that aspect um, and just pick up where you left off. Well, my never never having um, listened to a book also goes into I've never really utilize Kindle to read anything either mm. because I am so much like I just want the book in hand. You like the you dead know, tree copy, yeah, right? That's, yeah. that's why, you know, like one of my, you know, tr- cherished pastimes is going through Goodwill, searching the books, finding yeah. those unique, you know, things that I can, you know, just kind of add to a collection that um, I don't have to read immediately. But at some point I'll, you know, might I'll just kind of look over and be like, I'm going to page through you today and, you know, being able to have that and look through them. Um, and I especially love um, older copies of things that uh, people have either taken notes in or written stuff down, yeah. or left little notes because... That's another layer on yeah, top of it. Yeah, you're getting that connection with someone else that either enjoyed the book or had a feeling about it or, you know, right. there's something else there. So um, it that will always be tops for me. I know that at some point it may go away just because that's the nature of things. Maybe not. Um, well, I mean, it's going to be hard to eliminate all of them. I mean, just look at True. your walls there. It's going to be hard to eliminate them all from existence. Yeah. They will always exist, yeah. but they may be produced less. And so I, I may have to eventually latch on to that digital a little bit more, but right now I don't have to. It's, um, you know, like when you think about it, like you, you have to, you pretty much have to have a cell phone now. Like you, you yeah, can't exist without one. Yeah. Um, but there was a time period where you didn't necessarily have to have it. You, you know, you could still have the home phone and there were yeah. other ways to do things, but now it's gotten to a point where if you don't have it, you are disconnected in a way that's really not going to be beneficial to your everyday life. Right. You can exist without it. We're right. not saying that you physically cannot. You have to have it, you know, in in some way. But it makes things insanely easier. Right. I, I would like connected. to point out to perhaps some senators and congressmen that a communication device is actually a necessity because there was somebody out there that said, well, you don't have to be on the Internet. No. It's like, well, mean- actually, you do because... The, almost all jobs now with big companies, almost all jobs, you have to submit it online. Yep. Have to. I mean, there, there's so many other aspects to that. You know, the, the, the fact that it could be your job that does it. Yeah. But for me specifically, my community exists online. Yeah. My interaction with other people, if it weren't for an online interface like that, my community would consist of four or five people and then some of the people I work with, but I don't see them. So yeah. whenever I'm not around work, I would either be by myself or possibly around the four or five people that maybe I interact with. And again, regardless of what people may think, you need some kind of community. You have to have that. You need that, you know, the ability to interact with people and engage and, yeah. you know, have those people that you can go to in a, a time of need for you or be there for them in a time of need for them. And for a lot of people in this day and age, that's online. You know, it's funny. I would not know you if it was not for the Internet. True. Because I met Ren through the Internet. Yeah, I mean, everything would probably have been a, a little different. Yeah. It, you know, had that gone down. Uh, obviously, everything would be a little different, but... Obviously, but yes, yeah, that I goes mean, without saying. But it's it's interesting how much the Internet has affected all of us and all of our culture. You know, all stop, no matter what you say, the Internet has affected you. So, for any politician out there that says that the Internet is not important or is a fad or is something that can be avoided, uh, they don't know anything and need to get a new job. Because yeah. they're not with reality. Vote them out. Vote them out. Get them out of there. Because they're the they're time, they're past their prime. By. Yeah, they're past their prime. So, and with that, I think that we'll probably move on to uh, to politics. But that will be in our next segment, uh, where we talk about the uh, the first one hundred days of the Trump administration. Uh, this is mostly going to be an off the cuff discussion, so don't expect giant uh, giant details in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we just need to talk about it. 
because it's a thing that's happened. So there we go. So with that, let me see, where's the show notes? I know I have them. Oh, Oh, wait, here they are. They're coming up. All righty. (coughs) So if you've enjoyed what we've done here tonight and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways. You can donate to the show through www.patreon.com slash O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O. That's patreon.com slash O-Really Radio. And get early access to full show content and extra content that we don't release in the normal stream. You can also uh, make the algorithm work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking and our signal in general. And you can use your words. Tell somebody about us. Really, no matter what, the word of mouth advertising is always going to be the best way to get anybody in front of a podcast because they've taken your word for it. They know that something's good there. Let us know. And of course, engage with us directly. Just as we just went on and on and on saying, these things matter to us. Contact us directly. Send us a message through the social medias or the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, 470-222-6759. That's always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. This is a service that is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pimgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you real soon for uh, for the rest of the things that we've promised you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. And then I just have to find out which one it is. There it is. Toodles. <laughs> <laughs>